Thanks, Felina. Welcome, everybody, to tonight's lecture. Uh, spine stings and shocks. It sounds pretty gruesome, um, but I think the key thing to remember is there are some harmful things out there, but it's usually accidents or, uh, I guess, um, not knowing what the animals are about when we do actually hurt ourselves. So um, tonight I'm just going to give a, you know, take you on a bit of a journey around the waters of Perth, uh, what animals uh, are around that could cause harm, and look at some more, I guess, uh, more deadly species which we find to the north, which we tend to not get, get here as, as much, but with, I guess, global warming, uh, various currents that come down which carry warm water, there's every chance they may turn up, so it's, it's, it's definitely worth knowing about them. So before I, just, I, I get into the, the various uh, animals, it, it's important to know why they are, are harmful. They, they've really evolved this way over time, so either they can capture prey, so they've got you know, long, sharp teeth so they can feed, or uh, they might have stinging cells which um, paralyse their prey. But alternatively, they might uh, be this way because it's a defensive mechanism. You know, a, a mollusk a shell might have long, pointy spines to stop an animal getting into the tissue of the animal or animals might feed on various toxins, so that makes them, I guess, not very tasty to other animals. So it's important to understand they're not the, you know, the, the mechanisms or the, the potential to hurt um, is really for them to survive. It's not to, I guess, hurt us as people who use the oceans. As I, as I just touched on before, Perth is in an area that we call, the, I guess, a warm temperate area going from Perth around the south coast. It's a little bit colder water. We tend to have animals that aren't, I guess, at the extreme end of uh, toxicity or levels of, uh, that can hurt us, I guess, compared to, I guess, up around the Kimberley, Shark Bay North, which we call uh, the tropical waters. And there the animals are a lot, lot uh, more deadly, the venom's a lot more potent. And it's, we're not really quite sure why that is. It's probably because uh, up there there's a lot more species, a lot more predators, it's a lot more busier environment with a lot more coral reefs. Maybe they have to adjust and and uh, to live in that environment. Looking around Perth, I mean, Perth's got a, a great deal of habitats which attract many of these animals. If you look along our coastline, there's um, a lot of sand and seagrass, like at, at Coburn Sound. If we head over to Rottnest, we've got beautiful coral reefs. Um, along our shoreline, there's, there's rocky uh, shorelines and intertidal reefs. So all these sort of uh, attract different suites of animals. So if we, just a quick uh, overview on where we find them. A lot of them we find on the, on the, the bottom of the seafloor. And I think the important thing to note is if you think you don't scuba dive or swim and you think you're not going to interact with these, it's not always the case. A lot of times during winter storms, uh, you get a lot of these animals breaking off in the swells and the winds and they'll wash up on the beach. So if you're a beachcomber, you certainly will come across many of the, the animals I'm talking about tonight. Also, uh, obviously, if you're fishing, you might um, obviously uh, hook, hook some of these animals up while you're fishing. Uh, if you're on a boat, you might obviously pull them up in anchors, etc. So it's worth knowing as well. The first um, species where all the animals we're going to look at is fish. Everyone's probably or heard of the cobbler or the estuarine catfish. Very common in our um, shallow coastal waters and estuaries. It likes to get in amongst weed, um, seagrass areas where it can sort of camouflage. It comes out generally at night to feed, and I think that's the time we have to be uh, realise that they are out. The most important to note about these, uh, this particular species is it has three venomous spines, one here in front, and you can't really see these very clearly on this um, photo, but one there, one up there, and one just behind, and they're obviously sort of needle-shaped, and we have to be careful, and a lot of the times uh, people have been, I guess, uh, injured with them is when uh, they're launching, retrieving their boats at night and aren't wearing suitable footwear and they might step on them. Uh, if you're catching one with fish, because they are very good eating, it, trying to get them off a fishing line wearing gloves is a good idea. If you don't, you know, a chance of getting sort of injured with them. And, and, and it can be quite excruciating pain. And a lot of people, I personally haven't uh, been injured, but a lot of people have gone to hospital for um, painkillers. So worth knowing about this particular group. The next lot is uh, the scorpion fish, and this one here is the western red scorpion fish. Very uh, common off, uh, off Perth in the, in the shallow reefs. A lot of fishermen would, would be familiar with these. Uh, these guys have uh, these dorsal spines here are all venomous. Um, certainly not deadly, but if you were to get um, punctured by them, it can be excruciating pain. Um, the scorpion fish has a relative same family uh, of the stonefish, which is in the tropics. We don't get it here, but um, they do have venomous spines and they are, they are deadly, the ones in, in the tropical waters. So one of many examples, which tonight I'll talk about the contrast between the two, the tropics and where we are here. 
Uh, looking at stingrays, stingrays are incredible, incredible animals. They can grow really big. They can grow up to about three metres long and, and two metres wide. So really sizeable um, animals and, and weigh up to something like 300 kilograms. Really uh, beautiful creatures to watch in, in the water just gliding along. Um, I certainly remember my first experience in seeing one. I was uh, swimming on the seafloor, um, just duck diving down from the snorkel and a beautiful day turned to night and I looked up and there was this massive darkness sort of moving across and you couldn't help but um, admire these creatures. Certainly admire them but also realise that um, they do possess one or two serrated spines on the tail and these are very sharp sort of knife-like barbs um, which some species do carry venom but I'm told that they, they, they really can cause a, quite a severe um, ripping of the skin if, if you do unfortunately get caught by them and if they do hit a major um, organ such as a heart or a major artery, they can actually um, uh, kill people and, and that was sort of what happened with Steve Irwin a few years ago unfortunately. Um, they're mostly found on sand, they can go to quite deep waters of about 100 metres or so, uh, but mostly you find them around sandy areas where they're scavengers and feed on sort of bits and pieces of leftovers from other animals. The next one is um, the numbfish. I personally think this is one of the more exciting creatures um, and sort of unknown creatures that we have around Perth and, and, and around the southern waters. It's called the numbfish. Mostly found in uh, shallow sand and weedy areas. The, areas. The, the, the great thing about this animal is able to produce an electric shock um, up to about 200 volts. Now it essentially works um, like a car battery has a positive end and a negative end and uh, an organ under its fin produces this current. Now, it uses this to uh, catch animals, so it'll bury uh, under sand and rubble and basically be camouflaged, and a fish will swim across and it'll cause an electric shock which will paralyze the fish or crab, which it can then feed upon. Unfortunately, they're hard to see and we do come across them when we, we dive. I have one story of a museum diver who was, luckily not me, diving with somebody else, and uh, they were down about 20 meters and uh, his friend was sort of crawling along the bottom looking in the sand and leant on one with his hand and got a quite a severe electric shock which actually knocked him out and his regulator came out and my, my colleague at the museum had to uh, carry him to the surface. So that's at the extreme end but they're certainly one to look out for. I've got, um, I've got one here, they're usually about, I should say they're probably about 30-40 centimetres dish shaped, sort of a grey uh, brown colour. I've got one here that's been preserved um, from the museum collection, so at the end of the, the talk I'm quite happy for people to come up and look a bit closer if you like. The next one, uh, we're all aware of sharks, they're, they're, um, they're just a part of our um, oceans here. Um, I, think, I think the important thing to know about uh, sharks is that they do bite, but uh, they really are occasionally fatal. I, I was gathering some statistics from 2010 and it was something in the order of worldwide there were 80 reported shark attacks and, and just six uh, fatalities. So really I think um, for the population I guess of the world and, and, um, and the sharks it really is low. Bearing that in mind if, if, it, is, um, if it is something that I guess you're concerned about obviously that um, they do bite, that um, there's a few things you can maybe do to reduce the risk. Some people, you know, they, they recommend obviously not uh, swimming around seal colonies, which is a, or diving around seal colonies, which is a known uh, food for, for sharks, or perhaps uh, limiting your time that you swim early in the mornings or late at night. Um, this is all just general um, things that may reduce the risk. Um, and of course, um, not, not spear fishing uh, around shark known areas if you can avoid that. Around Perth we have um, definitely the great white, we have the tiger shark, now the tiger shark's probably not, uh, probably hasn't been credited to as many as tax as it probably ha has done, it's sort of uh, one of these that uh, probably is mistaken for great whites and it's probably thought that they're more abundant and probably causing uh, more shark attacks than say the great white, so they're one. They're mainly um, tropical ti tiger sharks to a degree. Uh, and of course there's the Swan River whaler or the bull shark which is, which is found worldwide but it's, it's certainly found in our, up our estuary and that can grow quite surprisingly up to about two and a half metres and is very, very aggressive, um, has certainly caused a fatality here in WA. Uh, but yeah, it certainly goes under the radar a bit but it is um, in our waters. Moving to a group which I'm a little bit more familiar with, 
is, is the, the mollus and, and looking at this particular shell uh, is the cone shell. Now the beauty about the cone shell is uh, it has a really unique feeding mechanism that it, uh, the picture you're seeing there basically, well I should say they're, they're pretty well found everywhere. It's another story that the ones you find up in the north are much more deadly than what we found here and the reason for that is the ones around Perth feed mainly on worms so um, they don't have as uh, a potent toxin which I'll explain how this works. So basically their nose is this long siphon which they'll sense uh, prey is around so through the water column. Then they will extend a large uh, sort of this is inside the mouth there which you can see there this large hollow tube which can stretch for up to 10 times the length of the animal and it will slowly creep up to a fish and it will jab it with this uh, barbed tooth called a radula piercing the skin and then it will inject a toxin from um, from its body which uh, is extremely um, deadly for, for these fish and for this particular species and it will hang on to this fish like a hook and, hook and line until it's paralysed and drag it into its, uh, its mouth there to feed. Quite amazing, I've actually got some footage at the end to show you, we we'll tried to incorporate it but it's probably easier left at the end to show you, um, of an animal feeding on a clownfish which I'm sure you will or will not like. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so they're really interesting. Um, a lot of times accidental stings with, with these, uh, and certainly the one around Perth, even though it feeds on worms, it can, uh, if you do get jabbed, can you give you a bit of a nasty irritation and can swell your arm up. There was a guy at the museum a few years ago that was quite interested to see what would happen, so was poking and prodding this cone shell for a few hours and eventually it did jab him and his sort of arms swelled up like a balloon. Um, so he achieved what he liked, but um, yeah, but certainly not deadly, but um, they certainly can, can give you a bit of an irritation. A lot of times the, the bites have been because shell collectors might be collecting a shell, which, you know, a cone shell there, which I've actually got here, which I should hold up. Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, so that's a, that's a cone shell without an animal inside of it. Most, um, some shell collectors think there's no animal inside, will take the shell, put it down in their wetsuit while they're diving and anything that's in a claustrophobic environment I suppose will react and uh, yeah, and can give them a nasty sting. So certainly one to be aware of. The next one is the, um, the blue ring octopus. I'm sure most, most people will be aware of this particular animal. Um, they're pretty well found everywhere. Uh, rocky shorelines, intertidal reefs, you'll mostly probably see them in areas where there's lots of rubble like uh, lots of cans or bottles or any sort of object they can get inside because they are a mollusk and most mollusks have, have shells. This particular species has, has lost or this group has lost its shell so it needs to um, survive in, in other ways which, which one is getting inside other shells, dead shells or bottles or what it does have has a very um, strong toxin uh, which can um, paralyse its prey. How they feed is they feed on uh, crabs and fish and what they'll do is they'll, they'll leap on top of them and, and they've got like a parrot-like beak which they'll sink um, saliva into the animal's flesh and reducing toxin which is in the saliva gland just behind their mouth. The mouth is on, sorry, the mouth is on the underside of the body. I do have uh, one here as well so happy for people to look at that a little bit later on. Um, and then they release it in um, pretty well instantly paralysing and killing their prey. They've, they're quite clever, they've realised that crabs, a lot of crabs have um, a hard shell and it's hard to, to bite so what they'll do is they'll smother the animal with their arms, uh, inject some uh, toxin into the water column keeping a sort of a closed aquaria and they know the, the crab will draw that up through its gills and then it paralyses it and then it can feed upon it. So really clever um, creatures. The one around Perth, we suspect it is a lot smaller and the one you see there is pretty, um, there's a couple of species but that's about the, the right size for what we have around Perth. Uh, they, um, th we think they're not as deadly as the ones up north. I was giving this lecture in Albany uh, a month ago and a lady sort of said that she uh, was walking along the reef flat and felt really sick and felt this pain go up her body and really metallic. Uh, taste in her mouth and sort of semi-paralysed and really nauseous and trying to think what it was and she said she didn't feel anything but we sort of diagnosed that she was bitten on the foot by a blue ring and the thing with a blue ring bite you don't feel it necessarily 
So, and she, I spoke to her a month later and she was um, still feeling pretty crook. But I think it, there's a couple of reports of that um, people surviving, I guess, along the south coast, which makes me think that this particular species haven't, you know, aren't the, at the, um, the highest end of, of the toxin, but certainly very, very um, deadly. And the ones over east have actually killed people. That's a different species. Um, another kind of um, mollusk is a, a clam, the razor clam. It has uh, these really sharp edges and what they do is they bury this part up to about here down into the sand and they usually, uh, using a bit of, I guess, like a cotton-like thread, they cement, they wrap themselves around an object like a rock and so are quite firmly fixed. And then you just see this top portion here which um, with bare feet on a sandy uh, substrate you can unfortunately get get cut so it's one to look out for probably more um, I know certainly very abundant down around the Albany region and, and around Coburn Sound there are some um, but they do have algae on this top part which makes any uh, cut get get infected and it's hard to um, to clear up another one is a and this is not the the best looking photo this one's obviously been washed up I'm not sure how many people are familiar with these but this is a giant sea hare. It's a type of, type of mollusk again, um, type of sea slug. It's, once again, it's a group that's lost its shell and it survives by, because it's lost its shell, it's um, survived by producing toxins or they feed on algae that contain toxins and incorporate them in their body so they're not very palatable. They also uh, release a, a several colours of dye which um, are semi-toxic as well. You will see these quite regularly washing up. Usually around late summer, they, they will go into a massive uh, breeding chain. And at the end of that, which is about one year old, they suspect they, they die and wash up onto the shore. Uh, it's kind of it's a little funny story that when around about late summer, a lot wash up onto Coburn Sound and there's, a, there's an abattoir nearby. And uh, these ones are a red color or blackish color and then a red purple dye is all in the, um, the water column and, we, and I've, we've had several reports of the abattoir getting abused for discarding um, animal parts but we have to assure them that it's, um, it's a natural event and it's certainly not related to the, the abattoir. So, but you do actually have to, to watch out for these um, for, for pets, dogs particularly. Um, they like to nibble at most things and these ones have proven to be um, yeah, a poisonous to, to dogs. Certainly I think last year or well, the year before, there are a couple of um, deaths in Geraldton uh, from um, dogs feeding on these. So please be careful if you do see them washed up, because um, they certainly, it's, it's similar to arsenic sort of poisoning that was reported um, when these dogs um, unfortunately died. Moving to another group of sponges. Uh, sponges uh, can be sort of hollow finger type structures or can be smooth flat structures but they all share a similarity they have millions and millions of pores which they bring in the water clean it and then exhale it through other pores a lot of them um, more again up the north produce these toxins because it's in their best interest to keep their pores uh, clean from uh, from any growth such as algae or other shells or things like that they produce these toxins and if you do handle them they can give you quite a nasty rash um, so it's something to be aware of. They also, a lot of them are made of glass-like spicules, which if you do handle them, uh, you will get sort of splinters, glass splinters, I suppose. They do wash up on the beach and it's important to watch out for any ones that are still, I guess, glistening, because it shows the spicules haven't broken down. And so, you know, I guess the, the, the best advice is to um, probably avoid them if you can. Following on from the sponges are the sea slugs. I spoke before. This, this particular group is, was a beautiful, colourful group. It really is, a, and a lot of divers uh, collect sea slugs, and they're actually a really, really, really pretty group. They, a lot of them feed on sponges, and they do this for a variety of reasons, but they also absorb the toxins from, from the sponges, and that makes them not a very tasty meal to predators, so not a lot of them are predated but also that they can actually kill predators that do, uh, in some cases, do eat them because of the toxins. So this is once, once again a defensive mechanism, certainly not harmful to us. It's just something I think um, was quite worthy of discussion. Moving on to the, the stinging group, I suppose. Uh, one of the, the hydroids or the, the sea ferns, as they're commonly called, 
pretty much found everywhere. They have these um, sort of tentacle structures which wave around in the, in the water and, and their job is to collect micro animals and algae that are drifting in the water column that you can't see. But they possess uh, a stinging cell, it's called a nematocyst and how that works, it'll, it's got a little sensory finger I guess on each, there's millions and millions of these cells along here and it's got a little sensory finger which upon contact uh, will retreat and sort of spring back and, and fire and um, administer, well firstly a bit of a sting but also it's very sticky so it'll grab the animal and then pull it back in so it can be fed upon. There's not many around um, I guess the Perth region that can cause uh, bad rashes but there, there are one or two that you should be aware of so um, definitely once again if you get north of Perth they can be quite um, quite a lot more I, I guess um, more stinging um, intensity. Anemones, kind of weird looking creatures, um, very common in Coburn Sound, this is well called the Coburn Sound anemone, has many many tentacles, they, they're pretty well found everywhere again but do like sandy areas where they can, um, you know, not getting obstructed and they can filter the water column quite well. They work much the same, they have the, the stinging cells again which um, fire on contact if uh, you touch them or um, its prey touches them so and they can be quite give a quite a burning pain in some cases ulcers can form uh, where the sting uh, contacts you so they're one to certainly be aware of. Another group are sea urchins. These, um, these probably prefer rocky areas where they can wedge in between the rock um, and protect themselves further but the whole sort of a defensive mechanism of these animals is to have these spines which stop uh, predators getting into the, the meaty tissue of the animals so they the ones sort of north have much the ones you see there have a long pointed spines which um, are venomous and can break off on contact and, and stick into the skin and, and really can be quite irritable the ones around Perth have more much shorter stubbier spines so it's it's harder to break them off and it's harder to get um, pierced through the skin possible but not not as um, as likely as it is with these particular animals there. So we've, got, we've looked at what's sort of on the bottom, now have a look at sort of what's floating in our water column that can cause, um, potentially cause us harm, okay. This was taken actually up at Scott Reef way off the Kimberley coast and you can see how sort of clear the waters are up there. First one is the blue bottle, um, for many many years the one we thought we had along our coast was the Portuguese man of war. That's proven to not be the case. I think the Portuguese, well, it's definitely Mediterranean, but the one here uh, is a different species, but once again, acts much the same, probably not as, uh, certainly not as um, toxic as, as the man of war, but basically it has this float up here, which drifts along in the, in the surface, and these drift along in the um, open ocean currents. So they're just susceptible to the currents. They have no, paddling power I guess you could say, they're just drifting along. So um, they have this float that, that drifts along and then you have this, this sort of colony, it's actually a, a family, it's not a sort of one individual, it's a family of animals here which have these two long feeding tentacles and they're like the, they provide food for the family I guess, they have these long feeding tentacles and they once again have millions of these uh, stinging cells on them. So the thing to know about these is they, they really do wash up fairly often around winter when you have the strong swells coming in from the ocean and, and the strong uh, westerly winds and they'll wash them up on beach. You will, quite, you will see them fairly often probably from now onwards uh, washing up. The thing to, to understand about these, if you see them one in the water and you're swimming, they break up a lot so if you see the, the animal sort of in one area, assume there's going to be lots and lots of little tentacles and that you can't see sort of floating in the column so if you're, if you're a distance from them you're, you're still a chance of getting stung I suppose. But, and when they do wash up they actually, the, the sting, stinging cells last quite a while, they last a few weeks or more so if you do see them uh, on the beach just, just make sure you're not sort of touching them and, and, and you know just take care of them, if you're wearing gloves that, that, I'm sure that's fine but probably just leaving them alone is, is probably the best thing. Um, yeah, and, they, and they, if you do get a, a sting, you get a raised mark on, on the skin and, and a sort of burning stinging pain. Another group is the box jellyfish. It's actually more correctly known now as sea jellies because some bright sparks said they're not fish, which um, 
So you can choose to tell them what, what, uh, whatever you like, either or. Um, but a lot of these are found inshore. You'll certainly, along the southwest of WA, we've got two species. We've got the southwest stinger, which if you've ever been to Busselton, you'll appreciate or not appreciate them. Uh, and then around Albany, you get another called the southern jimble, I think it is. That one there you see is the southern one around Albany. Um, it might even come up to around Busselton. They might overlap. Um, but these guys, uh, they pretty much feed at night, so they'll, they'll rise up at night and then during the day if there's intense sunlight they'll sink to the bottom. That's generally their, um, their, their pattern, their day-night pattern. Um, because they've got all these stinging cells, unfortunately when they're abundant they, uh, they can cause havoc in swimming areas. Um, and they're, once again, they're pretty well prone to the, the currents and, and conditions. So if you get those still summer days with maybe a light sea breeze, they will wash into bays and estuaries and uh, marinas and things like that. So um, on those sort of still summer days, that's when you'll, you're likely to get swarms of them, I suppose. Uh, produce a, a painful sting and a red mark. I'm sure we've probably all been stung at one time or another. Oh, I'll just take you back. That one there is a, is a northern species. I'm not sure of the name at the moment. I'm forgetting, but that, um, that certainly is deadly and has been responsible for a few, a few deaths um, up north, Broome, across northern Australia. Yeah, I think it is that one, yeah. Uh, another group uh, are the sea snakes. Quite incredible creatures. A lot of people think we don't have them down around Perth. We do. We have one, at least one species, which is the yellow-bellied sea snake. It's not that one you see there. Uh, I don't, no, it's not that one there, but it uh, certainly is around Perth, and we, we have had a lot of um, records of them. We do get um, other ones drifting down from the north that might swim down with the currents and have a bit of a feed and, and a look and then and head back. They're certainly not residents like the yellow-bellied sea snake. Very, uh, very deadly um, uh, tox or venom that they possess, uh, but their fangs are, I was reading, their fangs are shaped in such a way or so small that they can't um, take a large bite and, and inject a great amount of venom into, um, into us, but certainly can cause um, deaths and certainly their, their venom is highly, highly deadly. Uh, they, do, they do go ashore to, to lay eggs, um, so you, will, you might see them on shore. And they've also got this great ability to dive down quite a long way. So I was reading several hundred metres they can dive down and they can hold their, their breath up to, I think it was five or ten minutes, something like that. Um, so yeah, really remarkable creatures, but certainly along the, along the beaches, just take care if you do see them. And moving on to another type of um, animal which we, we all love but can, can, be, uh, can be harmful um, at the wrong times or um, the wrong times of the year. They are very playful but um, they can bite you. Uh, usually around the time that uh, the mother's um, looking after her pups, she can be, can be quite aggressive if there's sort of separation between her and the pup. So around that time, it's best to keep a distance. But because of the nature of what they feed on, and I suppose any, any teeth like that, a, a bite um, can cause quite a serious infection. I think it was last, might've been this summer or last, I think someone was actually bitten around Donga region, I think. Um, so yeah, they do actually, they can bite and then can be quite a nasty bite, so. So that kind of leads me to the end of, um, and I've got a clip to play it in a moment, but um, an understanding of the animal, various animals we have. I think it's important to, to understand that all these various mechanisms that they have, they've evolved that way so they can capture prey or can defend, because it's a pretty hostile environment out there when you think of all the predators um, that are they're looking to get them. So they're certainly, none of them are looking to harm, harm us when we're in the ocean. It's usually just accidental. So. Um, and we are fairly, fairly lucky if you compare to an area like Broome up that way where each of these relatives of the species I've talked about today are a lot, uh, lot more deadlier. And around here they're certainly not on the same scale, so we are, we are quite lucky. Um, and as I've mentioned, usually a lot of the, the accidents that we see are from, um, or sorry, the, the, the incidents we see are from accidents. You know, a lot of people say collecting shells and sh shoving them down their wetsuits or um, handling fishing lines without gloves or walking along the, the beach, uh, sorry, the, uh, 
the reef into the water without the proper footwear, all of these things are usually how we, uh, we, we get injured. There's not many of the animals I've talked about today that really sort of see, see us coming into the water and, and want to harm us. It's certainly not, not the case with many of those animals. And I think the, the easiest way to, to, to understand or to, the safest way, I guess, is to look um, but don't touch approach. Admire them but uh, try not to, to interfere with them too much because that's when they might, uh, might end up um, at, you know, attacking us or harming us. Now I'm just going to move across to the next one and this is just going to be a short clip on the cone I'll play this a couple of times, it's quite quick so hopefully this is loading, there we go. I'll explain. Oh sorry, yep. So, that's, that's not Nemo, by the way. Uh, I'll, I'll play that again. I just thought I'd show you some of the various things I spoke about. So, at the top there, you can see it's siphon, which it's obviously smelling the, the clownfish that's... Um, in, this is all done in an aquarium, by the way. Maybe it happens in the water, I'm not sure. Um, so then you, um, you can see this long hollow tube I spoke about, that's the proboscis and at the back here there's a, a sack which contains numerous um, of these, these uh, barbed teeth that I showed you. There's like, it's like a semi-automatic rifle, you just keep producing them and producing them. So that'll come out of there and this will sort of gently come under the animal, sense the right moment and jab it with the, um, the tooth and then it'll inject a toxin because this is a hollow tube into the animal and then it'll hang on to it like a fishing line and then expand its mouth from which the hollow tube comes out to, um, to capture it. So I'll, I'll show you that again. I'm not sure I should. But. <laughs> um, this, was, this was taken from YouTube, I got permission for the, that's something I should have mentioned actually, a lot of these, uh, particularly the cone shell, is because of the, the toxins that they produce, they're actually being um, looked at to, as a pain, to synthesise pain relief compounds, certainly one species up north, they have synthesised the toxin and they're looking at a whole swag of other cone shells to, um, and, and and one day hopefully uh, will be available to aid in pain relief for us. So it's kind of a nice twist. I mean, it can, they can, I guess, be deadly, but in some ways they can really, really assist us. Um, yeah, so I think that, that pretty well brings me to the end of my talk tonight. Um,